commercial free Catholic charismatic channel. He's strengthening the faith of so many people. To promote the gift of church teaching, dedicated for the new evangelization. God's blessings on your work, may God bless and prosper you. Shalom World, God's own channel. Welcome to another episode of Luminous. My name is Jason Duderman, and I serve as the Director of Youth, Young Adult, and Campus Ministries for the Roman Catholic Diocese of Dallas. I remember as a young kid, one of my favorite things was to go down to the beach. And at this particular time in my life, it was my favorite of all the vacations. And in this one particular vacation, we went down to the beach as a family, and my mom and dad decided to take my sister and I out to, to be able to sit out and enjoy the day as soon as we got there. We're sitting on the beach, we're having ourselves a good time. My sister and I are building sandcastles and in the midst of that, my dad had gone off to go and find some food and my mom decided to take a little nap on the seashore there. And so my sister and I were just kind of playing by ourselves, building sandcastles. And I remember my sister was running around. She was grabbing driftwood from wherever she could to help build up the castles that we had. And she ran out of that wood. And as she kind of looks out over across the beach, she noticed that there was a piece of wood. It was kind of bobbing in the surf. It was going back and forth across the sand. And she goes and she looks at me. She says, Jason, I've got to get that wood. And so she takes off running down the beach, jumps into the surf and goes to get it. Well, as she does, waves come in and they grab the wood and it pulls it out a little bit. And so she jumps into that water and she starts to swim after that wood. And naturally, before she knew it, as I'm sure you can imagine would happen with a small child, my sister found herself drifting further and further and further out to sea, far off the seashore. And at one point, I'm noticing the waves are starting to get larger around her. And for me, I'm just a small child myself. And so I'm starting to get a little scared. My sister is out there and she's in the water and she's bobbing and I can see her arms doing this in the surf. She's about to go under. And I remember turning around and I look up, at, up on the beach, looking at my mom and I'm screaming, mom, mom, Lauren, she's out in the water. She's out in the water. Mom, she's going to drown. My mom couldn't hear me because she was sleeping at the time. Something amazing happened. As a small kid, I was mesmerized by this. I remember looking up and as if out of nowhere, there comes this man and he's wearing red shorts and he's running as fast as he possibly can down the beach to get to where I am. And he hears me screaming and I'm pointing frantically out to where my sister is. And he looks and without any form of hesitation, he jumps into the water. He starts swimming as fast as he can to get to my sister. He grabs her from the water. He starts to swim with her back to the seashore. And not only does he have her, but he also has with him in tow that piece of driftwood that my sister was going after. Without any hesitation, he jumped into the water, not worrying about himself, but selflessly worrying about someone else. I wonder how many times in our own lives do we find ourselves feeling adventurous like that. So much so that we begin to test new waters. We want to see how close we can push to those boundaries before we're outside of the help of God. How often do we find ourselves wanting to see how far can we get while still calling ourselves Christians or followers of Jesus Christ? How often do we try to push ourselves outside of God's saving grace? That's a question that I found myself struggling with. And yet, the beauty is that when we read through Scripture, when we realize the beauty of God's salvific history, the way that He constantly gives of Himself to save His people, we see that God is constantly reaching out to us and that we're never outside that grace. In fact, that God is always like that young man who selflessly jumped in the water after my sister. 
Now, you might be asking yourself that question, well, how do we know that? Where in Scripture does it say that God is always going to be with us? I want to take a little bit of time here in these few moments that we'll have together to break that open. The first thing I want to start with is just a couple of passages that point to it exactly. We know, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, it says very, very explicitly in St. Paul's letter to those Corinthians, he says, love never fails. Love never fails. We know again in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 18, that Jesus looks at his disciples and he says these words. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. And you live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I in you. How beautiful a message that our God, that Jesus Christ, would look at us and say, I will not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you to drift out to sea, only to be lost in that abyss of our own anxieties and our issues, and the lack of glamour, and our sin. That Jesus is constantly there to pull us back. Now sometimes we find ourselves wondering, what does it really mean to be children of God? What does it really mean to invest ourselves in who God is, knowing that God is not only our creator, but he's also our father. He is the one who loves us more than anyone else or anything else could possibly love us. To really understand that, we've got to go back to the beginning. And how beautiful in this time of ordinary time within our church is it that we can go back and start to really look at and think about how is it that God loves us and how is it that from the beginning of time, he has known each of us by name and called us and made us each by name. When we go back into scripture and we look at Genesis chapter two, we can see this from the very beginning. Now, we know in Scripture that there are two creation stories. We have the God who, over the course of six days, breathes into existence all of creation, right? He creates the moon and the stars, the darkness and the light. He creates the animals. He creates the birds in the air, the fish of the sea, and then he creates human beings. But when we go into Genesis chapter 2, we see something even more extraordinary. We see a God who is willing to humble himself in a beautiful way to create us. Let's dive into that for just a moment. In Genesis chapter 2, God plants the beautiful Garden of Eden, and this is what happens. This is the story of the heavens and the earth at their creation. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, there was no field shrub on earth and no grass of the field had sprouted. For the Lord God had sent no rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a stream was welling up out of the earth and watering all the surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and placed there the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God made grow every tree that was delightful to look at and good for food, with the tree of life in the middle of garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God then took the man and settled him in the garden to cultivate and care for it. The Lord God gave the man this order, you are free to eat from any of the trees of the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. From that tree you shall not eat. When you eat from it, you shall die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suited to him. So the Lord God formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all of the birds. The man gave names to all the tame animals, all the birds of the air and the wild animals, but none proved to be a helper suited to the man. So the Lord God cast a deep sleep on the man. And while he was asleep, he took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with, fre- with flesh. The Lord God then built the rib that he had taken from the man into a woman 
When he brought her to the man, the man said, This one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for out of man this one has been taken. You see, in this story, God fashions from the earth the human being. When we go and we look into the ancient Hebrew, we know that the words used in the Hebrew scriptures are the ha-adama, referring to the clay. And God seems to get down in this story. When we really look at it, it's as if he gets down on his knees and he begins to play in the clay. He starts to fashion. And what does he do? He creates this beautiful figure. Now, what does scripture tell us? Scripture doesn't say that this creature is a man. It doesn't say that this creature has a nose and a mouth, that it was beautiful. All it says is that this creature has nostrils. And what does God do? God breathes his own breath into that man. I want you to think about that for a minute. God not only forms the man, the ha-adam in Hebrew, the creature of the earth, but he actually gives of his own breath and puts it into the man. And then as he continues, he gives all these wonderful things to the man, the birds of the air, the animals, all of these things for the man to name, to care for, to consume for his own sustenance and realizes that that's not enough. So what does God do? God continues to give. And playing divine anesthesiologist, he puts the man to sleep, takes the rib from the man and creates for the man a woman. The two become one. God is constantly giving, constantly wanting to make sure that humanity has, that humanity experiences love. Think for just a moment. When we go later to the prophet Jeremiah, we all know those beautiful words where God looks at us and says, behold, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to keep you, plans to give you a future. God has never in any form or fashion deemed that we should be created and simply let to flounder, let to be captivated by sin. And we know the beauty of this story that even in the sin of our first parents, Adam and Eve, that despite the beauty of their creation and going and eating from that tree, being cast then out of the Garden of Eden, as they begin to recognize their own sin, that God still gives away. He gives the person of his Jesus Christ. But we're not there yet. Let's keep looking. We continue to see God's beautiful love for us despite our sinfulness in the words of the prophet Hosea. Now, we know from the prophet Hosea that God had called him to take on a spouse, And the spouse of his was an adulterous spouse. It was a woman of ill repute, a woman who unfortunately did not follow after the words of God. And so the children that the prophet Hosea and his wife have are children that God says he will call not my people. One of the kids is called not pitied, terrible names for a kid, not something I would ever want to name my own. And yet God then still later says, I'm going to take you into my own heart, into my own life. And we see in the words of the prophet Hosea, chapter 2, that God says this, that despite all of our sinfulness, he says, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me with justice and with judgment, with loyalty and with compassion I will betroth you to me with fidelity, and you shall know the Lord. He goes on to say, I will sow her for myself in the land, and I will have pity on not pitied. I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he will say, my God. Regardless of where we've been in our lives, regardless of how adulterous we have been in our relationship with God, God still looks at us and says, my love, come back to me. I want to betroth myself to you. And how does he do this? He looks at his children from the people of Israel to, in 2015, you and I today, here and now, and says, I give myself to you. 
and he does it through the person of Jesus Christ. In the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, we hear a parable that all of us have heard before. And it's one I wish to share with you briefly now. The parable reads like this. Jesus, looking at his disciples, says, Then he said, A man had two sons. And the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat? But here am I, dying from hunger, I shall get up and go to my father and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, quickly bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fattened calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. We've all heard this story before, coming from the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus is looking at his disciples, sharing this parable, and we see the son asking for his father's inheritance. Now, we know from ancient Jewish times that for a son to ask his father for his inheritance before his father had passed away was to wish his father dead. And yet his father, in great love for his son, says, Son, if this is what you want, I give it to you. In the same way, God, even in our infidelity to him, even in our moments of sin where we decide to give ourselves over to something other than what God would ask of us, God gives us that free will to say, no, you know what? If that's what you want, I offer it to you. Take it. It's not what I want for you, but I love you enough to let you make that decision. And in that moment, the the son who realizes that he's done wrong, that he messed up, He runs back to his father and he says, Father, Father, I don't even have to be your son anymore. I'll be one of your slaves. I will work for you just so that I can fill my own physical needs to eat, to have a place to rest my head. And in the midst of that that sin, the father says, no. No son of mine, none that I have called, that I have fashioned with my own self will simply be a slave. But regardless of what you've done, my son, I welcome in you back into my home. So much so that I even give you a robe and a ring on your finger so that you remember that you are mine. Amen. My brothers and sisters, we have a God that loves us. A God that regardless of where we are at in our lives, regardless of what we have done, reminds us that his love never fails and that we are never outside of it. This was never made more clear to me than when I became a father myself. I'll never forget that morning. It was four o'clock in the morning. My wife and I had just given birth to our very first, a little girl. And I remember being in that room, watching as my daughter breathed her first breath, and I began to cry. I didn't know what else to do. And as my daughter continued to grow, and we continued to share with her our love, I remember coming across a book. 
And you know children's books, they have a tendency to, to be beautiful, and some of them are, are kind of hokey, but this particular children's book hit me in a powerful way because it reminded me of God's own love for me, and I wish to, to share it with you. It's a story called, Wherever You Are, My Love Will Find You. As I share with you these words, I want you to hear in your own heart and mind God saying these words to you. I wanted you to know more than you will ever know, so I sent love to follow wherever you go. It's high as you wish it. It's quick as an elf. You'll never outgrow it. It stretches itself. So climb any mountain, climb to the sky. My love will find you. My love can fly. Make a big splash, go out on a limb. My love will find you. My love can swim. It never gets lost, never fades, never ends. If you're working or playing or sitting with friends, you can dance till you're dizzy, paint till you're blue. There's no place, not one, that my love can't find you. And if someday you're lonely or someday you're sad or you strike out at baseball or you think you've been bad, just lift up your face. Feel the wind in your hair. That's me, my sweet baby, my love is right there. In the green of the grass, in the smell of the sea, in the clouds floating by at the top of a tree, in the sound crickets make at the end of a day, you are loved. You are loved. You are loved, they all say. My love is so high and so wide and so deep, it's always right there, even when you're asleep. So hold your head high. And don't be afraid to march to the front of your own parade. If you're still my small babe or you're all the way grown, my promise to you is you're never alone. You are my angel, my darling, my star. And my love will find you wherever you are. I remember reading that story to my daughter for the first time and weeping at the end of it, and my daughter looking at me with this perplexed look on her face. She's only a few months old at the time, and she's looking at me as I'm weeping, trying to figure out, Daddy, why do you have water coming out of your eyes? What is this emotion that you're expressing? I simply didn't have words, because there is nothing on this earth that my daughter could ever do that would be outside of the love that I have for her, because God allowed me the opportunity to participate in her creation, she is of me. She is of my own. There is nothing that she could ever do that could cause me to not love her. My brothers and sisters, God loves us the same way. God loved us so much that he created this beautiful world that we live in that we read in Genesis chapter 2 just a few moments ago. If you don't believe me, step outside your home, get off your couch for just a second or when this episode is over and go out and look at the beautiful world around you. God created that for you. And as if that wasn't enough, he became like you through the son, through the person of Jesus Christ he who outstretched his arms on that glorious cross so that you and I could be reconciled with him and experience his love forever because his love never fails. Our God, our loving Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, looks at us and says, it doesn't matter where you are, how far out to sea you have gone, my love never fails. Today, I invite you to remember that regardless of where you are in that journey, that regardless of how far out to sea you might feel that God is present in your life, don't believe me? Go experience the sacrament of reconciliation. Go experience the sacrament of Holy Eucharist wherein God continues to share of himself in his body and his blood allowing us to become his living tabernacles, to be one with us. Remember, 
Hope has a name. Joy has a name. Peace has a name. Love has a name and it never fails. That name is Jesus Christ. As my sister and I stood on that beach, what I didn't realize is that my mom had heard me. In fact, in my moments of looking out to sea as my sister's being pulled away and that lifeguard rushed out to get her, my mom was coming down the beach the same. And as she got to the beach, as that lifeguard pulled my sister up out of the water, my mom runs over and wraps her arms around my sister. And she simply said this, I love you. That my mom, in all of her anxiety and all of her fear, and all of, I'm sure, the anger she wanted to express to my sister for making a decision that wasn't that smart, the only words she could say to really help my sister understand what it was about were, I love you. Pray with me. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving Lord Jesus, we come before you in these moments offering praise and worship to your holy and glorious name. Lord God, challenge our hearts in this moment. Help us to know that no matter what we do, that no matter how far away from you we walk, that there is no sin too great, that there is no fear too powerful to strip us away from your everlasting love. Lord God, help us to know always that your love never fails. Grant that as we continue to walk on this journey toward you, that even when we feel as if we're so far out to sea, that all we can see is you jumping up and down on the seashore, beckoning us to come back, that you will jump into that water and bring us back. Challenge us, if we haven't been to the sacrament of reconciliation in a while, to go, to find the next time in our parish or at the Catholic Church down the road and get some time with that priest to experience the beauty of that sacrament and be washed clean. If we haven't been to Mass in a while, challenge our hearts to get back, to receive you in your body and blood, for it is there that we know and we truly experience your love. Lord, we love you so much and we thank you for giving of yourself. And Mother Mary, our most precious advocate, turn your eyes upon us that through your intercession and your prayers, through your immaculate heart, we might come to know your Son, Jesus Christ, in a greater way. Let us pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless you. Teach everything he commanded them to teach. New ways to communicate God's word. Present positive images to our people. This message of truth and salvation culture of uh, encounter. Gospel of Christ worldwide. Shalom World TV. Twenty four seven. Faith-filled, dynamic, virtue-building, commercial-free, family-friendly, Catholic charismatic channel to the whole world. Promote the gift of church teaching. Dedicated for the new evangelization. Mentor the young into a deeper embrace of the Catholic faith. Wonderful contributions to the church. People of prayer.
attractive people, attractive messages. Peace of Christ. Promote the values of life. This is media at its very best. The voice of the church. With great love. Taking this to the next step. Shalom World TV. Shalom. 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 Shalom.